After more than a decade in charge of the Hong Kong Exchange, Charles Lee is one of the longest serving leaders in the global financial industry. He's pioneered key market reforms and acquisitions to help transform Hong Kong into the world's top fundraising venue. These include the deal to buy the London Metal Exchange in 2012, and the Stock Connects tying the Hong Kong Exchange to its counterparts in Shanghai and Shenzhen, earning him the nickname Mr. China. Charles Lee's departure comes at a time when the ties between the mainland and Hong Kong are in sharper focus than ever. I sat down with him in one of his final interviews as chief executive of the Hong Kong Exchange. We talked about his legacy, the challenges he dealt with, and what's next. I'm Sophie Kamarudin. Here's my conversation with Charles Lee. Your announcement to leave early came as a surprise, but the environment has allowed for an opportunity for a smooth transition. But nonetheless, how can you leave? Why can you leave before your checklist is really finished? Well, actually, the checklist is just keep growing, and uh, so it will never get finished. So I think uh, there's always going to be a point where somebody else has to carry on with the list and adding more things onto the list or changing the list. And uh, so I don't think uh, that's something that uh, we can avoid. But the key is that uh, it's time to potentially take a pause and, uh, and have somebody else who hopefully with the renewed energy to do so. I still have a lot of energy left, but I think doing something for this long in one stretch is probably I think we both can take a break. Now, you've seen that energy at work, the bourse, under your charge, 11 years. So much was achieved, which had people asking, why so much so fast? Can the exchange continue that momentum going forward? Well, I don't really think necessarily we made a decision to say that we have to really go very fast. Do we have to get X, Y, Z done? But I do think um, uh, when you keep asking questions about how can we do this better, why we are not doing that? Why are we still doing this way? So if you keep asking questions, the, then the challenge is that things start to get onto the list. I think it's just lucky that during this 11 years, that China is going through a major transformation. And when China, such a big economy with its own financial system, making that sort of a move, being able to anticipate that, being able to find a way to work with it, it's just create a lot of mon momentum for you. But obviously, if you miss it, if you're distant, or if you're counterproductive with it, then obviously it, it can be also quite miserable. You've helped push Hong Kong to be a burst among the top leagues, uh, raise its global profile. You've managed to push through reforms like the dual listing uh, in Hong Kong. Uh, how tough a battle was it to get regulators on side? Well, I think our regulator, um, you know, there, uh, people sometimes make a big deal about our differences with the regulator. So I personally think that uh, our, our regulator and ourselves just sometimes have slightly different perspectives. And uh, you sometimes lose patience, and they sometimes lose patience. But in the end, I actually consider that uh, the relationship between Hong Kong Exchange and uh, our own regulators have been a very constructive one. You've been willing to go on adventures, as it were, to take a leap 2012, the acquisition of the LME. Unfortunately, not a follow-up goal with the proposed merger with the LSE. Yes. With that episode, what are your biggest takeaways? Do you think you had the support? We do have the support. We were very clear, very beginning, that there are four things we're going to want to do. You know, when I started, one, we want to connect the waters. Two, we want to change the fish. Three, we want to expand outside Hong Kong and outside equity. And lastly, we want to modernize our platform. So the acquisition is really our number three strategy, which is to really expand beyond equity and expand beyond Hong Kong. And we took the first step, which is really LME, which is beyond equity to commodities and beyond Hong Kong to London. So that's a great uh, venture that give us the confidence and give us the perspective and give us the experience to think bigger. But the LSD, we probably were a little bit late because we were trying to see whether Brexit 
is going to make a big difference on valuation, big difference on risk, on everything. And uh, so we were left with either just sit tight as if it never happened, even though we fundamentally you know, decided to do it, with very broad support at the board and also st other stakeholders. Or we do something. So I decided, okay, let's go and shake the tree. Maybe the apple will fall. If it does fall, it's our luck. It didn't. Then we walk home. What more could be done on the data and innovation front, upgrading legacy infrastructure, monetizing data, for example, at the exchange? Yeah, I think uh, the exchanges are all, you know, looking into the future and increasingly are looking at data as an alternative, both as an alternative to leverage how to do trading better, but even over the longer period and horizon, potentially trading data itself as an asset class. I think we are still a long distance from that second vision. But on the first vision, you see global exchanges really going out of the way, trying to build their data capabilities so that they are able to trade in its current financial system logic, but trade it more effectively because they have more greater access to data. So in that uh, regard, the Hong Kong exchange itself is probably not yet as advanced. But we probably are going to go through a slightly different direction. Charles, as you said in the past, a house is not built overnight. Renovations take time when it comes to the mission to upgrade the exchange. Is the house on solid ground? Are you satisfied with the foundation that you've put in place? We got a big house, we added big wings, big rings, and, uh, and the big yard and everything is big. But inside the core house, it's an older house and uh, it's built on very solid foundation. It built on very solid but older technology. And uh, we have been working at the technology at the house in so many ways that the house works like a clock. But it doesn't mean the house is gonna be able to do more than things. I think into the future, we need to modularize it. It just means that uh, every time we launch a new product, it takes a little longer than the next guy. Every time we do something, a change of risk management, it takes longer than the next guy. But in terms of reliability and stability, we are number one, globally number one. You know, everybody's system seems to have been, some thing is done here, some outage over there. We had none of that for the last 11 years and touch wood, we will never have that. Coming up, Charles Lee on how he found the magic sauce to connect China and Hong Kong's markets. Hong Kong is now permanently on a irreversible track of connecting its market with China. And uh, we just have to find new ways to move up. pushed hard to great effect. Linking the exchange with Shanghai and Shenzhen was, as you called it, a mission impossible. What kind of convincing did it take to get the, those programs off the ground? Did you at any point think it would be too difficult to open up the mainland market? But what has given us confidence is the fact that we believe that we found the magic source. The magic source is that uh, you have two systems. The reason people think it's a mission impossible is because two propositions can't coexist in the same sentence. You're opening up a market and maintaining capital control. So you can either open up without capital control or you can have capital control but without a free open market. How can you find a way to make the two coexist? That's really is what connect, because we can't ask China to uh, completely forego capital control. But we can't ask the international market to go into China to trade in the Chinese way, because they can't. So the magic sauce is net settlement, local net settlement. That is all international investors are settling and clearing with Hong Kong clear every day. 
and all the international and the Chinese investors investing into Hong Kong are settling clear with China Clear. So every day, only me and China Clear are changing a bag of money on the Shenzhen Bridge. Only one amount each day. That's really is the key magic sauce. What's the pathway to a southbound bond connect? Uh, I think southbound is pretty much uh, a consensus that is going to happen. Um, the actual plumbing of it uh, is just now being worked out. The most important thing about Connect is that Hong Kong is now put permanently on a irreversible track of connecting its market with China. And uh, we just have to find new ways to move up. You also have something to say when it comes to fixed income and currencies, the progress that could be made there. Internationalization of the UN, that is a potential driver for that. What's the biggest hurdle in making progress on this? Yeah, I think uh, for fixed income, we either find a way to become relevant in the global scene first, in dollar, yen, euro, or sterlings. That's what LME is all about, and that is what LSE is all about. So you get into the business first, and then you wait for the R&B to become relevant and becoming prevalent, and then you start to capture the opportunities there because you are already in the incumbent fixed income and bond market. Since we are not there yet, so we need to be looking at that and see whether we can continue. Shanghai and Shenzhen, they're being nurtured as financial hubs. So what challenges does that pose to Hong Kong uh, going forward? What's the outlook here? I don't really think uh, um, it's really that relevant because that market is going to be f continue to expand, continue to develop. Think of the international market as a big circle. China market is a big circle. In the past, the two circles doesn't you not even touch, and then they gradually touches, and then gradually kind of cross over. But is Hong Kong's role? as part of either circle in jeopardy? No, I mean, you know, obviously when they want to go to separate moons, yes, Hong Kong would find either you become, you know, uh, 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 you become part of China, you, your international role is get disconnected. But that's not the case. This two circle has always been getting closer and closer and then eventually overlap and eventually more and more of them are overlapping. The Chinese market will never be like the international market in its entirety. The international market will never be able to suit into a Chinese market, but there will be enough, you know, middle ground where they do intersect. It is in that intersection that Hong Kong have to find its the most relevant role to play. Amid tightening scrutiny of Chinese companies in the U.S., more listings have come to this side of the world. How can Hong Kong deepen uh, capital markets and really champion more homegrown uh, IPOs? The great thing about Hong Kong is that fundamentally it's an international market, but has a very deep Chinese DNA and, and roots. So it's naturally going to be a place where international capital finding the best inter Chinese company and the Chinese capital finding the best Hong Kong listed entities. So we have four customers. We have Chinese money, Chinese underlying, international money, international underlying. I think historically we are a market of Chinese underlying international money. With Connect, international money is going into China as well, but the Chinese underlying, uh, the Chinese capital coming to Hong Kong in a big way. So our missing customer is international underlying. So international underlying today has no fundamental interest in listing in Hong Kong yet, because it's just like any other place. However, if one day Connect can move into primary Connect, mm -hmm. that you are able to do a big deal here for the Chinese investors to buy you, then a lot of big companies will naturally come to Hong Kong for listing. Because Hong Kong could be a great place for China to do some very big mega swaps. There was momentum towards embracing Chinese assets. We've seen index compilers, for example, including uh, those equities on their indices. That has stalled somewhat given the U.S. sanctions imposed by the Trump administration. What are the implications of that on China's attempts to integrate into the global markets and its liberalization on the mainland, as well as Hong Kong's role in this? Well, I think uh, there are only just really three big markets left, U.S., China, Europe. 
with the pandemic exposing the fundamental flaws of almost everybody, everybody's weaknesses has been you know, exposed through this pandemic. But if you, can, if you look at that global map, invariably you will walk away with the conclusion that China is the place where yield is going to where it's going to be because fundamental economic development is stronger there the consumer class is growing there the people are getting more wealthy the currency is becoming stronger and their supply chain is as resilient as strong as ever while this decoupling will continue to put stress on the respective economies of uh, each other I think relatively speaking, the Chinese market will become increasingly more important for global investors. So yeah, government, policy makers, individual political figures can always do whatever they wanted to do that could potentially create short term temporary impact on a more localized target. But as I said, finance money is like a water. You can't you can't block water. There was a hiccup to that flow and financials IPO getting postponed. How did you feel about that? Obviously, um, everybody was anticipating, was looking forward to the biggest IPO in human history um, that always carries with a lot of uh, fanfare, a lot of uh, a profile. Um, there's clearly a disappointment to when that did not happen. But in the end, it's probably the right decision because uh, they do need to sort out fundamentally what's the relationship between the, the kind of financing activities that are driven largely by you know, alternative main means you know, through data or others vis-a-vis -vis, you know, financial regulation and whether how the two sometimes really are not really conflicting each other, but sometimes they potentially could become uh, issues. Coming up, Charles Lee on the future of Hong Kong and what could be next for Mr. China. All my life I've been a water engineer because I've been dealing with finance and I think finance in many ways has the same characteristic of water. Charles, as you've stated in the past, the rule of law, having a talented financial services community, those are paramount in securing the future of the bourse and Hong Kong. Given the dramatic changes to the city's political climate, what kind of impact has it had on the exchange? Well, I think everybody is finding ways to adjusting to the changing landscape. Our society clearly has changed. In the last two years has not been easy for Hong Kong. and uh, but. The globe is changing. The kind of underlying conflict, the kind of underlying social inequalities, the kind of underlying you know, populist discontent against the elite is a global phenomena, is not a Hong Kong unique phenomena. I think in the end, for a financial market to truly thrive and succeed, you need stability, you need predictability, and all of that can only be guaranteed under the rule of law. And uh, obviously when we talk about rule of law, it means a lot of things. You know, it could mean uh, a common law tradition. It could mean liberty. It could mean, you know, a complete and due process. It could also mean, you know, um, you know a, a higher level of security national security. Every country also worry about a national security. Today, the good thing is that Hong Kong is back to normal. Hong Kong is back to stable. Hong Kong is back to rule of law. People may not necessarily like the different kind of practices, but it is reflective of the unique reality of Hong Kong today, which came from the last couple of years, which came from the last uh, decade of various challenges and conflict. 
we just have to find a way to adapt to it. I personally still feel that this place is as resilient as ever, is as strong as ever, and uh, whatever happens in Hong Kong that some people may not like doesn't bother me. You know, life goes on. Well, I have to ask, would a student as chief executive of Hong Kong entice you in any way? Politics is not something you, you know, that, that, that you wanted to openly discuss because it's, it's very difficult to talk about it, whether you want to do a certain job or not. Because even if you want to, you shouldn't be talking about it. And if you don't want to, you shouldn't be talking about it. Because people are going to say, who asked you? Why you said you're not interested in becoming uh, chief executive of Hong Kong? Who asked you? How presumptuous you think uh, that you'll be asked? So I don't get involved. It is not uh, a particular area of interest uh, that, uh, uh, that I discuss. It is something that whoever chooses to do it, I look at it in admiration. The makeup of Hong Kong's financial markets has transformed under your leadership at the exchange, with new economy players more prominently in the mix. How should the city's economy and growth drivers better reflect that kind of change uh, when it comes to its policies, job creation perhaps? Yeah, I think uh, the financial market in Hong Kong and the underlying economy are related, but in many ways they are not related. Um, you know, us closely, because after all, we are a small place. We are only seven million people, a thousand square kilometers. We don't produce anything. We don't manufacture anything. So by and large, we need to be part of something bigger. But our economy needs outside forces to make it work. You either have tourists coming in, or we export our labor, or we become a high-tech hub, or whatever it is, we can't be alone because seven million people can't feed each other in a small little place. What's next for you? You've indicated that you're keen to strike out on your own, become a water engineer perhaps, water here being a metaphor for money. All my life I've been a water engineer because I've been dealing with finance and I think finance in many ways has the same characteristic of water. And so I will continue to be in finance. So that's what I said, uh, that I want to continue to be a, a water engineer. Now I, find, I want to find some different directions to work the water. water. Um, small media enterprises, for example, in China are massive. They play a huge role. There's no reason why they're not being properly financed. And, uh, and also, China is so digitalized that its small and medium enterprises actually probably are the easiest financeable, only if we can find a more creative way of doing it. So that's the kind of area I want to you know, begin to devote my attention to, and hopefully uh, from um, massive water project kind of a guy, maybe into a small Israeli dripping uh, navigation kind of a, kind of a uh, possibility. So I'm thinking through it. That's my conversation with Charles Lee. I'm Sophie Kamarudin. This is Bloomberg. <laughs>